so we took so so far about um, letter from Johnson's alternative view of meaning and what might be wrong with the representationalist view and its effects. Um, so the last bit really I, I want to talk about is is um, how to relate meaning to the whole idea of integration and the idea of the integration of meaning. Um, and uh, in order to have an integration of meaning, one also needs a, an understanding of how meaning might not be integrated in the first place. So hence the term fragmentation of meaning, uh, which means the, the separation of meaning, if you like, um, the opposite of its integration. So perhaps to, to, to get that concept clear to start with, let's, let's go back to defining meaning. So in terms based on a kind of Leif Johnson embodied understanding of meaning. Um, that meanings are desires attached to symbols. That's sort of a basic definition of meaning I want to use here. Yeah. I didn't quite get that with the E flat analogy because we were saying that was information. Yeah. How is information part of that definition? Uh, no, how is desire. How the, the desire there with E flat? Oh, right. Well, our emotional relationship to the, to the E flat and the, the role it plays for us in our, our associations. Uh, so, so you know, there might be a feeling of longing associated with the E flat, for example, right. or, or it might just take satisfaction in the, being able to play it, or you know, yeah. the, 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 the um, okay. yeah. various kinds of ways that it might be meaningful for us. Yeah. Well, of course, it might not be meaningful for us. It might just be noise, but um, that's another possibility. But if if the E flat is going to be a symbol for us, then um, it's got to have meaning. But if it is noise and it's unpleasant, isn't that? You say that denotes non-meaning. Well, if it was unpleasant, then it would have a, an unpleasant meaning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> so, 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 so it can be negative as well as positive. Yeah. yeah. But it can't not have non-meaning then. Uh, well, you could more or less ignore it. Uh, uh, like the plane analogy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So but I guess some... this, this tapers off the, debatably, you know, maybe there's nothing that we experience which doesn't have meaning to some tiny extent. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but um, I mean, you can also talk in terms of perceptions that we don't have any particular expectations or associations with. You know, something new comes up that we, that we see for the first time, so it's not yet meaningful to us because we haven't sort of associated symbols with it um, or turned it into a symbol. Um, mm -hmm. But so, very quickly, you know, it might become meaningful. So when we colloquially say something's meaningless, what we typically mean then. Uh, not that it doesn't have meaning, but that meaning is incoherent. It's um, it's it's not integrated. It's yeah. Is, is that it's, it's, it's um, yeah? I mean, it, to varying degrees, it, it might include. It doesn't make any impression on me. It doesn't stimulate me. Yeah, right. or it might mean um, it doesn't relate to a coherent set of representations that, that, that I can have in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but if we define um, meaning is desire, did you say, attached to a symbol? Mm. Um, isn't that reducing meaning to an emotive, an expressivist extreme? Well, not if you understand the idea of, of the attachment to a symbol via this whole process we've been talking about. So, so the the, um, the neural connections through image schemas um, which, uh, and metaphors and so on, which do create cognitive models in the process. So, so yeah, this is, is obviously a, a distillation, the idea that, that meanings are desires attached to symbols, and it's emphasising the desire aspect, which we tend to, to neglect. I think. But, um, yeah, you also need to recognise the, the representational elements um, in, in any given attachment to a symbol, mm -hmm. what's involved in attachment to a symbol. So we're not throwing the representational side of things out the window then with this no. model? No. It's just the representational side, you know, we still have a left brain, yeah, the representational of side of things needs to take its place within a bigger, a bigger framework, framework yeah. yeah, and not be the whole story, which yeah. is what we've traditionally been told. Mm -hmm. um, and just for ease of reference, is there a kind of... Um, a word 
that you would use to represent that middle position between representationalism and expressivism? Have you got an ism <laughs> the, the kind of <laughs> that embraces this, well, this kind the, of... Well, the middle way yeah. uh, right, in right. relation to meaning uh, yeah. okay. um, okay. would be the best I have at the moment anyway. Mm. Or integration of meaning as well. Oh. Yes, although that's a slightly different way of modelling it, which I'm going to try and explain now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, so um, we were talking yesterday about the way in which the ego creates conflicts of desire. Yeah. So, the ego um, associates with particular desires at the moment, uh, which it thinks are the whole story, uh, and you know, in particular beliefs associated with those desires. Um, and it tends to repress one any any uh, other designs which are opposed to it or incompatible with it. Um, so um, you know, you, well, we're just talking about um, you know a teenage girl moving from one boyfriend to another. You know, so sort of one one um, person will will be in focus who who is. In the representational model used is you know, the object of love, and then move that aside, and then you know, that then becomes forgotten with a, with a new model coming up with a, with a new representation of what's happening. Um, so th there's um, there's an association which we were talking about yesterday of um, desires in in the ego and the ego's process of repression. Um, but desire generally works through association with symbols, so so we, we don't just have sort of raw desire by itself. We will have ways of representing those desires to ourselves. Uh, we will have goals in mind, which we will uh, have particular symbols of in mind, which which will um, we will be thinking about. Um, so you know whether it's you know our idea of a, of a person, for example, or um, a particular idea we we believe in, you know, Jesus or whatever it is. Yeah, um, the the um, so in a sense, it's it's quite difficult, I think, to think of desires without symbols being involved somewhere. Uh, they they probably uh, you know in in theory we could you know, manage without them, but in in practice, in human life, symbols are everywhere. Um, so, if we if we just think of the integration of desire as we discussed it yesterday and tack symbols onto it, we, we've got the basic model of how the integration of meaning works. But um, if we try and understand what kind of state that's um, moving us on from, you know what what it uh, what the equivalent to conflict is in terms of meaning. It becomes a little bit more complicated. So, so the fragmentation of meaning um, is—I mean, broadly, it's kind of conflict associated with meaning, but but it's it's a lack of understanding of an engagement with symbols. So, so it can be a a lack of cognitive meaning, which prevents us understanding ourselves or understanding others. Or it could be a, a lack of emotional connection with mm -hmm. ourselves or with others. That stops us understanding ourselves or others. So when you're in Japan and you don't speak Japanese, yeah, then that's the cognitive side. Yes, that's an example of it. Yes, yeah. So remember, this has to be in experience. So, so the fact, you know, at the moment I'm not in Japan, so it's not of great significance to me the fact that I don't speak Japanese. But if my experience was was of being in Japan and not being able to speak Japanese, then yes, that would be then become one of the sort of conditions of fragmentation, which I could begin to address by learning Japanese. Yeah. Um, but obviously learning Japanese wouldn't change things very much unless I also engaged with Japanese people and tried to understand them and understand the cognitive models and the way they think about things as well as just their, their language and what their language cognitively denotes. Um, but this process can also apply to oneself, so it's internal too. So think about the way in which the ego um, disassociates from past and future 
self uh, thinks of itself as. Um, we can find our past or future selves meaningless, or we can find it difficult to engage with our past or future selves. We can find it difficult to engage with the the symbols used by past or future selves. I don't know how far anyone's experienced this, but I guess the the um, clearest example in my experience is, is that, um, well, 20 years ago, I was at university. One of the things I studied was uh, Middle Indian languages, Prakrit, uh, as well as Sanskrit and other Indian languages, um, which I have barely touched or really understood since. So uh, at that time I wrote, I had a commonplace book where I wrote down sort of significant quotations and stuff. And, and so I wrote down uh, a nice few lines of poetry in Prakrit. This is about 1987 or something. Uh, anyway, a few years ago I went back and looked through this commonplace book and saw that I'd written down these lines of poetry which I really felt obviously were significant in 1987 and I could not make head or tail of them. Um, mm. So it wasn't, it wasn't the, the script, I could still read the script because the, the script sticks in my experience, but, <laughs> but the, the grammar and the, the vocabulary, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a long way off. Um, so uh, yeah. it's, it's uh, I just didn't understand myself, I had no relationship yeah. with those symbols. Could another example be getting really, really drunk on Friday night and not worrying about the effects on your future self the next day? Yeah. Um, it, in the sense that, um, yeah, if, the, if the, the kind of ways you're expressing that to yourself don't really make much impression. Yeah, so, so supposing you're, um, you're thinking about uh, or, or you consider... When you're, you know, in the process of getting drunk, you think about the how difficult it will be at work the next day to um, concentrate, given that you'll have a hangover or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but that doesn't really mean very much. You know, there's, there's a bit of a failure of um, of emotive meaning or fragmentation of emotive meaning there, even though you understand the the cognitive yeah. ideas involved. Um, yeah, so to some extent, yeah, that, that applies there. So it can even apply in the more immediate um, field to oneself. Um, so if that's the, the fragmentation of meaning, then integration of meaning is where we overcome that sort of fragmentation. To some extent, it's all to some extent. Um, and there are three basic ways we can do that. Um, so we can learn new symbols. For example, for example, learning Japanese, um, or within our own language, obviously you can learn a new vocabulary. Um, linked to that actually is um, extending on the uh, the meanings we use for words we already know, um, or and obviously this doesn't just apply to language; it could be art or music or whatever. Um, so we can learn new symbols. We can extend this our fund of symbols, as it were, but. That's kind of necessary, but not sufficient. You know, you can learn loads of new symbols, but they may not be that much use to you if you haven't sorted out, if you haven't balanced the approach. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get people who become walking encyclopedias and have got loads mm -hmm. of symbols, but they can't apply it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so another way of integrating meaning is to clarify the symbols we use. Um, and now that really works within a particular cognitive model, within... Uh, the left hemisphere activity. So if we're using uh, a particular cognitive model uh, in a clear way, then obviously it helps to avoid misunderstandings, you know, and that's, that's where we use, use dictionaries and clarify terms and analyze and, and, and all, all that kind of process um, does help uh, with the integration of meaning as long as the overall cognitive model is sufficiently shared by all those involved. Um, mm -hmm. So if I'm in a discussion with an analytic philosopher and we clarify the terminology we're using, um, that will work up to a point, um, but we may just discover we're talking across purposes because we just got completely different reasons for doing philosophy or different yeah. motives or different underlying cognitive models. So. 
What we were doing last night with the MVC, was that a process of integration in the sense that we were exploring the cognitive model and then trying to apply it and actually and that process of application is, is a process of kind of integration? It is, yes. It's um, particularly in, in making it more emotively meaningful. Mm. Uh, you know, when you apply it, it becomes, you know, your body's involved in it in a way it wasn't, yeah. wasn't previously. Uh, so it becomes more meaningful in the process. Mm. And also learning those new items of vocabulary, just that tie in as well. Yeah. So, so those can help to provide the tools for doing that. You know, so particularly if you're um, trying to engage with a, with a relatively new cognitive model, and you, obviously, you, know, you have to learn the technical terms, as it were, yeah. within that, that way of talking. Um, so yeah, this could also, the integration of meaning might also involve um, you know, learning new, new fields, uh, you know, engaging with, with particularly diff areas that we haven't engaged with before or might not have formed part of our formal education or something of that kind that, that um, you know, in doing that we're extending our ways of thinking, we're extending the, the range of symbols available to us. Mm. Um, Anyway, yes, yeah, so, so there's learning new symbols, as Kleinfanger was we use, and then there's also tolerating ambiguity um, as uh, an important aspect of, of the uh, integration of meaning. So when we get beyond particular cognitive models and where there's a clash of cognitive models, um, you know, you can clarify for all you're worth, but it won't help you anymore, you know, unless you can actually make that a shift between one cognitive model and another, and you can only do that by some tolerance of ambiguity, by recognising you're not going to get it all nailed down completely. Yeah. Um, and that's that's where um, I think the, the, the various aspects of the arts, particularly, that, that help us to, to move outwards from being stuck in one cognitive model to a bigger picture. Um, and very often that involves um, the use of ambiguity of some kind um, to enable us to, to, to shift in some way between metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, and also, does that being suspicious of perfection play a part in that as well? When you're writing your book, you could always go back and you say, oh, right, I'm going to publish it or whatever. There's always going to be other stuff that you want to put down, but you have to say uh, at some point, even if it's not perfect. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you're, uh, perfectionism is a very sort of a left brain thing, isn't it? That mm. the idea is you, you've got to get it exactly right, so it's got to fit in this um, ideal representation you've got. Mm -hmm. um, but things in experience just don't do that. <laughs> you're never going to quite get it perfect. Um, it's kind of similar to sort of ex uh, using metaphor, is it? Is it in, in the sense that um, you know you start off with a metaphor and, or a model? using a metaphor as a model but you can only stretch it so far or, and, and or it, you might have more than one metaphor for understanding a situation and the mm. two don't kind of completely fit together so yeah. you kind of have to you can't think of the both at the same time you kind of mm. use one metaphor for one purpose and use another metaphor for another purpose but yeah except the fact they don't kind of completely yeah. mesh yeah <clears throat> those exercises you spoke those, those speed riding exercises are a good example of working with ambiguity, aren't they? And tolerance of, mm. of non-perfection, in a sense. Mm. Yeah. 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 I think of models within therapy. Um, when you were talking there, I was thinking about uh, within cognitive behavioural therapy, uh, you talk about core beliefs and, and schemas. Um, but the precise meaning of a schema in or a core belief in cognitive behavioural therapy is slightly different from that in schema focused therapy and the two the one kind of grew out of the other but they aren't kind of exactly the same and you can't, they're not sort of interchangeable so yeah it's just kind of an, a, a, that's, that's what I was kind of thinking of when you were describing that it made sense to me so does a schema then mean effectively the use of a metaphor or a, a schema from schema focused therapy is much more to do with sort of uh, um, your expectations of the way that things work, relationships, um, your, your kind of models that you, you learn from a, an early age. Yeah. Um, and they can almost be pre-verbal. Um, you kind of, you learn that a certain behaviour 
is or is, you know certain outcomes contingent on a certain behaviour or whatever and, mm. and that might be learned long before you can actually verbalise what you're doing yeah. mm. um, whereas core beliefs in the, in the cognitive behavioural therapy model are, are very cognitive they're like propositions like you know I'm bad or I'm unworthy or so in a sense the schema view of things is much more nuanced and and maybe it's not a great example because you could also imagine you could could in some ways I suppose you could actually integrate the two completely in a, in a way it might be possible to do it if you thought of the core belief as being the cognitive dimension of or one cognitive dimension of a schema you, you could maybe sort of absorb the CBT model into the scheme, into schema focus model, so maybe it's not a great example of that. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean there's, there's an issue there I think about the clarifying the relationship between meaning and belief in the, that that um, I think there's a there's a further stage moving on from, from sort of the set of symbols that you, you use and, and the assumptions you make about what they mean to your commitment implicit or explicit to a proposition or a set of beliefs about what you think to be the, the case. Um, but um, so it sounds as though those are combined there in that approach, are they? Mm. Mm. But, um, I mean, that's, that's something we discuss a bit later, but, and also tomorrow we'll be talking about belief as well. Um, so, yeah, the fragmentation of meaning. So, um, can be created by representationalism. So one of the issues with representationalism is that it, it contributes to the fragmentation of, of um, meaning. And it does that basically by encouraging the belief that a particular metaphor is absolute. Um, so you, know, you, you think that this is, um, well think about representationalism works on the assumption that uh, meaning works in relation to a cognitive model and this cognitive model is is the representation of reality and it's meaningful because of its relationship to reality. So, so the set of assumptions in representationalism encourages the fragmentation of meaning through the, the assumption that it makes. Um, so the, the, um, the cure for that, if you like, or the response we can make to it to try and alleviate it anyway is, is um, to bring in new symbols and, and tolerance of ambiguity. So, so um, that um, obviously there can be new ways of understanding meaning, but but also we can um, yeah the more we can bring in alternative metaphors and alternative ways of thinking, the more we can practically help to break up these sort of representationalist tendencies we might have to to believe solely in one model. Um, and then um, fragmentation of meaning can also be created by linguistic and cultural differences or by our attitude to them. So, so earlier we had the example of the Japanese that, that Barry brought up. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the kind of um, response we can, we can make to that is a yeah, new symbol so you can learn Japanese um, or you can clarify what you already know. So, so supposing you're communicating with this Japanese person in, in a very limited English vocabulary and you're you know, misunderstanding each other, whatever then, um, well, clarification is part of a process of language learning, isn't it, that you, that you have to um, perhaps check with somebody that you're talking to that you're using the word in the same sort of way uh, and also think about the, the context in which it's being used. Um, so, um, yes, I remember um, actually a good example of this that, that um, Louie and I told me because she's a, a, a linguist by training and um, she gave me the example of um, a person in Africa giving a sentence, or being given the sentence, um, a man went to the market to buy mangoes. No, it's buy yams, actually, it doesn't matter really. Anyway, the man went to the market to buy yams. Um, and... Um, for some reason, there's this anthropologist talking to this African person you know, um, about this sentence and the significance of this sentence for him, but they say, no, this sentence is wrong. 
and, and they couldn't work out what was wrong with it because um, it seemed to you know fit together the grammar's correct you know the mm. words all mean something and um, but the problem was in that culture men don't go to market and men don't buy yams so <laughs> it was just culturally wrong you know, the whole context in which it was being thought about was 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 seen as well um, so fragmentation of meaning might just be created by things like that, by, by cultural assumptions, mm. as well as, as strictly linguistic ones. So clarification might obviously help with that. Yeah. You haven't spoken much in, 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 in about um, about coherence and, and consistency, uh, and um, but that's that's a feeling that I was getting from from what you were talking about integrating meaning is, is attempting to increase the degree of consistency with which we I don't know um, the, 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 you know what you're saying that these different metaphors or different models don't fit together exactly that there's a mm. kind of an ambiguity mm. but that the process of integrating meaning is kind of a, a constant juggling rearrangement sort of trying to get them to fit together mm. a little bit more effectively yeah well that's that's the why we need both the the um, clarification kind of method and the tolerance of ambiguity method and they, they work in a sort of dialectical relationship so so on the one hand we need the the left brain analysis and the critical thinking skills which will help us to build more and more coherent, well, sort of bigger and more adequate cognitive models. Um, but at the same time, those models, part of the adequacy of those models depends also on them recognising that they're not the whole story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so it's, it's things like the, the arts which make us more aware of that fact that they're not the whole story. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, isn't it, because it, it, even in science, you know, which is probably the most representational it's very much at the sort of representational end of the spectrum. Mm. Even if you avoid scientism and turning it into metaphysics, mm. it's still kind of at that end, if mm. you like. And you've got these kind of, you know, the, these these problems that scientists are working on around how quantum theory doesn't quite fit with relativity, mm. and it's mm. that, that's what they're kind of struggling to kind of reconcile. Mm. Mm. On the other hand, though, uh, when science is done well. It's dealing with um, probabilities, you know, and so it has that, that there's the, the ambiguity there. So, um, mm. to be an effective um, practitioner of science, you you buy into the idea of falsifiability, and that and that things you're you're working towards a theory that addresses conditions better than potentially than the other one until, but it's it's not that that is the, the final answer. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the how scientific method works at its at its best, um, yeah. and we'll, we'll talk more about this tomorrow. But yeah. but it's um, there's also this tendency we have that the to slip into the, the the idea that this this theory is the the complete explanation. Mm.